Good morning, everyone. This is Christy Willard, Director of Teacher Certification. We'll get started here in just a few minutes. We'll give a few minutes for everyone else to continue joining. All right, good morning and happy Monday. Looks like we have folks um, pretty much finished joining. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Legislative Affairs Policy and Workforce Support Monthly Call. This is the May 16th edition. I'm Christy Ballou, I'm Director of Teacher Certification. Um, on the call also have some colleagues of mine, Ashley Townsend from Policy. Um, we will get started. So first up, we're gonna talk through some certification updates um, and then we'll move on to Bessie and legislative updates. And then of course our um, call summary and important dates. So the first thing I would like to um, bring to your attention is we've noticed um, that some school boards or charter schools or maybe other entities that are similar um, have started using the child care criminal background check system or the CCCBC system. Um, for pre-K to 12 teachers and staff. Um, this is really not the purpose of that system. So the FBI and other federal entities very strictly prohibit the use of this system for any other reason than um, early childcare. Um, we're gonna talk through some of the prohibitions and, and things like that, why it's prohibited on the next few slides. Um, I do have a colleague of mine, um, <clears throat> Hayden Malawson from the early childhood um, side of things um, on the call as well to answer any questions, but we'll go ahead and get started on why these are prohibited. So there's a total of five entities that actually um, get the data for this particular person um, sent to when they're using that CCCB system. Um, the FBI, um, they check against their federal criminal res registry, the Louisiana State Police, um, they check against the state criminal registry. It also checks the National Sex Offender Registry, Louisiana State Sex Offender Registry, and then the Louisiana Department of Children and Family Services um, for any um, checks against child abuse or neglect, anything on their registry. 
So a negative result from any one of these entities can make that applicant ineligible to work in a child care um, system facility. Um, it can be based on convictions for certain offenses as well. Um, and those convictions may not necessitate ineligibility for certification or employment of the pre-K-12 staff. Just it depends on where this negative information comes from as to what it prohibits and, and what it will um, necessitate ineligibility for. Um, there's also the flip side of that, um, any convictions that are listed on the CCCBC could be permissible for eligibility to work in childcare, but it might be prohibited for certification or for employment in the pre-K-12 school setting. Um, there are two separate laws that govern employment in a pre-K-12 setting and then certification of staff in a school setting. Um, of course, there's also BSE certification policy that has further restrictions on certification specifically. For example, all felony convictions are prohibited for certification in a pre-K-12 setting for certification. Um, if they have felony convictions, they can have um, a record review and be cleared for certification, but that has to be done through BESI, the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. So first off, in certification, we would have to deny them. Um, so a clearance on a CCCBC provided um, when using that CCCBC system could be a false clearance document, um, and it could have legal consequences, of course. Um, additionally, criminal history information is very, very strictly governed by federal regulations. Um, any criminal history information obtained has to be used for its original intended purpose. It also can only be used for one purpose. So if you're obtaining and using the criminal history information for more than one purpose or for not the original purpose intended, that's a direct violation of federal regulations. And of course, there are certain consequences that come along with that. So we just wanted to flag this for you all to make sure that you were aware um, that it, it could open you up to legal ramifications. Um, some other information that you may need to have is that the Louisiana Department of Children and Family Services, they only have the right to check on their registry for people who are attempting to work in child care. So they not only don't have the legal right to search their registry for a pre-K-12 applicant, but they're not even entitled to receive that person's PII or personally identifiable information. So by doing that check, it's not only going to have ramifications for you as a school system, um, but it could also be putting other departments in precarious situations as well. Um, if and when DCFS declares an applicant ineligible, LDOE, um, we have to immediately make that applicant ineligible for child care purposes in the CCCBC system. So if an entity or provider incorrectly used that system for a pre k 12 teacher, they would be made ineligible immediately. So this creates an issue because DCFS and LDOE early childhood have never received their information in the first place. Um, it just causes a whole lot of issues if you're using this system instead of the system um, that you're supposed to be using. So um, we're flagging for you all that um, you must restrict the use of the CCCBC, CCCBC system to child care exclusively. So we do know that some of you do have those early publicly funded early learning centers. Um, and so if it's for child care, you absolutely can use it for that particular um, educator. We have attached that user agreement that should have been signed by all entities before they were allowed entry into this particular system. We've also linked the, the state laws that describe the use um, of the child care criminal background checks. And then of course, Bulletin 137, Chapter 18 provides a little bit more information for you all for that. So we wanted to provide you with the information that you needed to you know, make your um, decision, um, make the best decision. Um, some other information, um, employment in a pre-K-12 setting and for certification, if, if you are trying to conduct a background check for that, school systems must use and follow Louisiana Revised Statute 1715 and Louisiana Revised Statute 177. We have linked both of those here for you. Um, these laws both indicate that a fingerprint-based criminal background check must be completed and submitted through Louisiana State Police for a check against the state and federal criminal registry. Um, this check has to be separate and apart from any check that's done through the CCCBC system. 
Of course, that CCCBC system is only used for individuals attempting to work in childcare. It is possible that individuals serving in a dual capacity um, will require two different background checks, one through LSP and one through the CCCBC system. Um, if an educator will be employed or on the campus of an early learning center, that's when you use that CCCBC system to collect the background information. This eligibility is only good for the purpose of working in that early learning center. Um, now, if an educator is gonna be employed in the pre-K to 12 school system or needs to be certified, so if they need to be certified, that could include some of your um, lead teachers and some of those publicly funded early learning centers. They're required to um, obtain an early childhood ancillary certificate or an ECAC. Um, so if they're required to be certified or they're gonna be employed in the PK-12 system, they have to complete that fingerprint-based background check through LSC as outlined in those two laws that we mentioned earlier. So this is just a flag. This may mean that multiple background checks will need to be completed on some individual. Um, we do recommend that if you have any questions recommend, uh, regarding these criminal history checks, first consult with your legal team. Um, and then of course, if you have any other questions um, specific to the CCCBC system, please contact Hayden Melanson at la.gov. I'm gonna pause right now to see if there are any questions about that um, to make sure, I believe Hayden is on the call um, and he would be uh, happy to answer any questions if you have. Feel free to unmute yourself or type them in the chat. So correct me if I'm wrong, these um, CCCBC background checks is for pre-K students? No, ma'am, they're not for pre-K, it's for anything pre-pre-K, so from infant to uh, right before pre-K. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Hayden, we have a question in the chat that says, if coming in from out of state, how is that handled? We have our out of state protocol. So if they're, if it's intended for early learning, then each state has its own protocols that we follow uh, for out of state. So if you're trying to hire someone for um, early learning or, or a childcare facility and they come from a state, uh, out of state, we have a uh, person who is put in charge of contacting that state and receiving their background check for, from that state. But I can't speak on anything that's pre K through 12 uh, with out of state. Diane, does that answer your question? So Diane, your question is about pre-K to 12, what do you do if, they, if they're serving in the pre-K to 12 system? <clears throat> so if you have hired the educator, you're gonna be applying for that OS on their behalf. <clears throat> so a part of that, um, one of the requirements and one of those revised statutes 1715 for employment in the pre-K to 12 setting is to complete a fingerprint based background check. So you'll need to follow those, um, <clears throat> those statutes and send that applicant for um, a fingerprint background check. And our current law in Louisiana, um, which is being amended, um, but our current law will send a copy of that fingerprint based background check result to us for purposes of certification. Um, now, as many as we have flagged before, that is also, even though it's a law on Louisiana state book, books and has been in place for quite some time, that's in violation of federal regulation. However, there is a proposed bill this session that is working to amend that. And so um, it's making its way through the, or has made its way through the house. I believe it just has to go through the Senate um, and we'll provide an update once that um, has passed and we have new protocols in place for that. All right, um, if there's no more questions, we'll go ahead and move on. Um, so the next update I wanted to provide for you all is around the Teacher Certification Appeals Council. We know this time of year is busy for everyone, everybody, you know, there are positions opening, there are contracts being signed, people are trying to fill their um, staff for the upcoming year. And so certification is definitely a hot topic um, and something that um, everyone is seeking to obtain. 
And in some instances, um, our office may have denied an educator certification because it falls out, their circumstances may fall outside of policy. Um, just wanted to flag for you all that the next Teacher Certification Appeals Council meeting will be held on June 9th, that's over the summer. Um, the deadline to submit that appeals application was this past week, I believe on the 12th. Um, since we know that there's probably going to be a need for it, um, we extended that deadline to May 20th, that's this Friday, to have any appeals application in. Make sure if you have an applicant that is appealing, there are a couple of things. Um, they first have to be eligible for an appeal. They first have to be denied certification by our office. So make sure they have that declination letter. They've received that and that is a part of their certification appeals application. Um, make sure that they do email their appeal application to certification appeal at la.gov by that Friday, May 20th deadline to be heard at that June 9th um, TSAC meeting. After our June meeting, um, the next TSAC meeting will be held on September 1st, and the deadline to submit an appeal for that September meeting is August 4th. Again, just wanted to remind everybody that um, policy does require to be eligible for an appeal that an applicant must first be denied by the certification office. So just wanted to flag those two upcoming meetings for you all since it will impact or could potentially impact the certification of educators that you're trying to put in um, places for the fall. Um, the next few slides you've seen before, um, we're just um, putting them before you again as a reminder. Um, we spoke about them on the past few calls, but as the school year is coming down to a close, just wanted to put them in front of you one more time. Um, the first is the ETS exam updates. ETS revamped some of their um, exams. Most of those were in science. Um, at April Bessie, uh, we did adopt those new exams. The current exams expire on 831 of 2023, and the newly adopted exam can um, be taken as early as September 1st of this year. So that will allow for that one year overlap um, where either the current exam or the newly adopted exam can be used. I've listed um, all those newly adopted exams. As I mentioned, most of them are in the science suite, but there are a few others that fall outside of that. That would be the early childhood special education or early intervention practices, the school counselor and the school librarian. I've listed the exam number that's bolded in parentheses next to it. And then of course the adopted cut score falls behind that on this particular slide. Mm -hmm. One other exciting piece of policy that was updated at April Bessie was the creation of a geometry add-on. Um, so uh, revisions were adopted to create this geometry add-on and the eligibility requirements are, they include basically passing that geometry content exam and having a valid standard professional level teaching certificate or higher. Just wanted to flag that um, as we have flagged in the past, um, applications were updated on April 1st. Those new applications were required to be used May 1st. So any application submitted on or after May 1st has to be on that new form. Just wanted to um, continue to flag that for you all. Make sure that you're always downloading the latest version of the application before you submit it to a candidate or in our online portal. Um, and then I'm just including, you know, this is our peak season, so processing times are increasing. We are continuing to train new staff. We hope to be able to kind of balance out and make it in, at least stay steady here coming in the future. Um, but our current processing times do exceed about 55 days right now. This is a reminder about those reading competencies. This is really most applicable for our um, stakeholders from our prep provider group that may be on this call. Um, there was a new, more broad interpretation of the Louisiana law regarding teaching reading. Um, for traditional programs, you still have to do the semester hours of three, six, or nine, depending on what area. Um, alternate programs have some options. The options include that teaching of reading exam or any um, or assigned assurances for the contact hour equivalent. Keep in mind that there was a law last year that we're gonna be bringing some policy around to June Bessie. And then there's also um, a law that's currently um, making its way across the street um, that may change these requirements in the future. Um, we did get an updated list from our teacher preparation program provider partners about their 
coursework being used. If we have any of you on this call with us, thank you so much for submitting that. If you've not submitted that, if you have semester hour coursework, please do go ahead and send that over to christy.balu at la.gov. We'd be happy to add that to our list of resources for certification specialists. Um, this is just a flag, a reminder for that House Bill 156. This is the piece of legislation that I referenced earlier um, around CBC legislation. Again, the background is that we found out um, in March of 2020 that our some of our Louisiana laws are actually in violation of federal regulation. Um, the nuts and bolts of it are that it's determined that a separate criminal history request, request is gonna be required for certification. Right now, we're getting a copy directly from Louisiana State Police when you as an employee school system makes that request. Um, this bill will seek to um, correct or alleviate the um, violations that are occurring of federal regulation right now. Um, it's not gonna be a water faucet once this um, law goes into place where it's gonna be cut off completely. We're gonna have to work with Louisiana State Police for a transitionary period. Um, but just wanted to flag that for you all that it is coming up. We did review lots of um, different options, what other states are doing, um, and this was the um, most effective option and the option that addressed all of the issues. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an update to 1715 and to 15587. Again, you, if you've participated on these past calls, you've seen these slides before, this is just a reminder. Are there any questions that anyone has? Please feel free to um, unmute yourself or type in the chat if you have any questions. All right, I don't see anything in the chat and I don't see anyone unmuting themselves. If you do have some questions, please feel free to continue to type them in the chat. But um, for the sake of time, we'll go ahead and move on. I'll pass it to my colleague, Ashley Townsend for Betsy updates. Good morning, everyone. I have just a couple of updates for you today. First of all, many of you know that at the special club meeting on May 5th, Bessie approved regulatory flexibility for seniors graduating in 2022 from the 25 parishes included in the Hurricane Ida disaster that was declared. In order to qualify for this regulatory flexibility, students must meet the four requirements here on this slide. If you have a question about which parishes were included, you can click the link here when the slide deck is available, it'll take you to that list. And if you have any questions about the substitutions that are available or any of the requirements or things like that, feel free to reach out at highschoolacademics at la.gov and they'll be able to answer questions relative to your specific situation. Also, our Bessie Regulation Waiver Request Form for next school year is now available on the website. I've linked it there for you. This form should be submitted via email to educationpolicy at la.gov. This is our new policy email address, so you can still reach out to me or to Nikki Landry. And additionally, we have this education policy um, email that we'd like you to, or that is also available for you to use with any questions you have, submitting forms, different things like that. Um, waiver requests for next school year should be submitted by June 30th so that we can get them on the August Bessie agenda for consideration by the board at that meeting. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. We have no official legislative updates at this time. Ethan Malasa, who's our um, executive director of legislative affairs, will be preparing a full update for you for our call after the session has ended. You know, it's a very busy time. There are lots of bills going. We're tracking about 200 different bills that are um, related to education and we'll provide a full update when session has concluded and we can process and get some information out to you about some potential next steps. There are no updates at this time from the Healthy Communities team. And you can see here some important dates about upcoming committee meetings, resources for you, and other things that are available. As always, feel free to reach out and thank you for joining us today. 
We'll hang on the line for just a few minutes. If any of you have any questions, feel free to ask them, unmute yourself, or type them in the chat. Um, if not, thanks for joining us, and we will see you on our next call. Hey, Christy. Sure. Hey, this is Eric with uh, St. Charles Parish Public Schools. How are you today? I'm well. How are you? Great, great. I just uh, saved me from having to register for office hours on this one. I have a gentleman who's worked with us for two years. Prior to that, he worked in a private school. Um, he is up for his level two. It would just be simply asking the private school to, to do that local attestation form to submit with the COMPAS scores. So we can't actually mix both COMPAS and uh, um, non-public um, evaluations. Okay. So um, we just have to apply then to extend his level one for one more year then. That's possible. It, do you know how many years that he was actually teaching at that non-public school? If he was teaching three years at that non-public school, it's possible that he has some other options to move no, to the level of asterisk. Yeah, it was just the one year that he worked in a non-public school. Okay. So if he has um, a level one extension left on his certificate, then yes, you would just request that level one extension. If he doesn't have any extensions left, if, if this particular educator has already used those two extensions, go ahead and request that level one extension and then we'll deny it, but then he could appeal for additional time. And so if you do need to schedule office hours call to, re, you know, to make that expediting request so we can get in for one of these particular appeals, feel free to do so. Excellent. Thank you so much. Not a problem. Anyone else? Any other questions out there? All right, great. Thanks everyone for joining. Happy Monday. Hope you have a great rest of your week.